welcome to the Lifting Report. I, the place, this is the place the news is never hidden and the truth always wins. Today we have two outstanding guests, Noni Darwish and Leo Holman. But first, since it's a Christian show, we'll start with a reading from the Bible. First John 2.7 says, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Keep listening. This is good. So what is this old commandment that John speaks of? What is it that we have had from the beginning? It is a message so simple, so important that humankind cannot survive without it. That commandment is that you love one another. John shares this commandment a little later on in this epistle. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another, that comes from 1 John 3.11. He also writes of this commandment in his next epistle. And now I beseech you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another, that comes from 2 John 1.5. How is it that we have come so far into the future and do not know this commandment? How is it that in order for humans to live after being born, that they must be fed, given love? Yet this commandment is not common knowledge today. Are we living a life of love towards others? Are we acting in a loving way towards others? John just told us the importance of following Jesus. And do we still not know that he was the perfect example of this old commandment to love one another? Dear Lord Jesus, help us to be the ones who live a life like you live such an example of your love for us. Lord, may whatever we have done in the past be forgotten. Lord, we ask that we would be able to live our lives for you. May your love be all that is important to us in all that we say and do. Awaken us in us more of your love that we may share you with those who have yet to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this Sunday we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. It's a day when many Christians will greet each other saying he is written. He is risen. With the expectation of a response, he is risen indeed. In light of this Sunday being a day of celebration of the gift of life given by Jesus Christ. This week we have two strong Christians as guests. Noni Darwish, my first guest of the night, is the author of many good books. She is a convert from Islam to Christianity. Her work, wholly different, why I chose biblical values over Islamic values, echoes my latest series of works on social norms. Now because of this, I just had to have her join us. So without further ado, I'm going to just play that interview. It is powerful. Welcome to the Sutlifium Report. We, this is a Christian news show, and you can tell uh, and share the gospel while we, while we answer some questions. You have written one incredible book that, uh, wow, uh, shows point for point, biblically, uh, how great Christianity is compared to uh, Islam. And what I like is, is you really lay out uh, important points. Like, um, I'm just going to pick a few of your chapters. I, I think absolutely, absolutely need to be addressed. Um, the number one I think I want to start with real quick is, is love your enemies versus hate Allah's enemies. Could you talk a little bit about that, Noni? <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure. Uh, I am I'm new to Christianity. I converted to Christianity from Islam. I was born and raised as a Muslim in Cairo, Egypt. And uh, I, uh, when I came to the West, uh, Americans believe that Islam is just another Abrahamic religion. And I... I really had to think deep about it because I 
started going to church and I noticed every value I learned in church, every, everything that Christianity believes is good, I noticed it's exactly the opposite under Islam. So I started asking myself, how could the West believe this lie that Islam is, a, has, is just another Abrahamic religion? Islam is not an Abrahamic religion. I discovered that Islam came 600 years after the birth of Christ, not to conform, conform, conform and even add on the Bible, Islam came 600 years after Christ as a rebellion against the Bible. The first rebellion against the Bible was in the Middle East and it was called Islam and Sharia law. Islam has values totally opposite to biblical values just the mirror opposite to the biblical values. Israel, Islam, which came out of the Arabian Peninsula, came out because the whole Middle East became biblical. The first biblical area of the world was the Middle East. A lot of people forget that Christianity started in the Middle East just like Judaism started in the Middle East. And the first rebellion against the Bible came out of the Middle East with values opposite to the Bible. And these values were inside the Arabian Peninsula. Muhammad discovered that he was, Arabia was on the verge of belonging to the, uh, to the, uh, empire, the, the, you know, the, uh, Egypt was part of the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire was all of Turkey. It included the area of today's Syria and Israel and Egypt. That was all called the, the, uh, the Byzantine Empire. It's a Christian empire. This is where Christianity started. And Arabia was the last area of the Middle East to be penetrated by Christianity and Judaism. Christians and, Jude and Jews lived in Arabia at that time and started penetrating their value system. And there was a, a natural rejection by Muhammad to these values. He wanted to assert Arabian values. Arabian values and biblical values were at a collision course. And Muhammad, in order to discredit the Bible, in order to reject the Bible, he had to discredit it. You cannot discredit something without claiming that you're part of it. He claimed he's part of the, of the Abrahamic uh, value system and then he said and now we reject it because it was he claimed islam until today claims that christians and jews intentionally falsified the bible see this is how you discredit something but but um there's nothing in the quran that actually claims that in fact it verifies the bible no, no, no. The Quran says that the Jews and the Christians intentionally falsified the Bible. It's, I, it's, I, that's how, that's it, how they wanted to discredit it. That claim I mean, is, was, that's what I was taught yeah. all my life. Yeah, I know they teach, they teach that to Muslims. However, yes, that, that claim um, is nowhere is in, that's something that's taught to every Muslim. I, it's not a question. But the, that actual statement is not in the Quran or in any of the Hadiths. It is. It is. It is. Okay. Actually, it is very, it's very, it's part of the basic. It st Islam started by honoring the children of Israel. Yes. And then they, Islam uh, flipped just like a psychopath. 
yes. flipped. And Muhammad made the children of Abraham his enemies. How can you say I'm an Abrahamic religion and <laughs> command your followers to kill all the children of Abraham? That's why Islam is, it started with, with a message and flipped on it. Muhammad flipped because he couldn't adhere to biblical values. He couldn't even follow the, uh, the Sabbath, which was a simple thing. And yeah, that was one of his first issues with Jews. He couldn't adhere to biblical values. You have to understand that the Quran is not a co coherent book. See, you presume Quran is a coherent book. Yes, at the beginning, but all of this was canceled. Uh, you know, Islam, uh, if you open one page, it says one thing, the second page could say the opposite. Yes. So don't ever assume that this is an Abrahamic coherent book. It's not. <laughs> okay. And it, it obviously uh, reject, it couldn't conform to the biblical values. Muhammad could not conform with his behavior and his belief system to the Ten Commandments. Muhammad was scared of the Ten Commandments. He had to violate the Ten Commandments. Islam violated all the Ten Commandments. I wrote in my last book a whole chapter about that. The title of that chapter, How Islam Violated All the Ten Commandments. Don't steal, but steal. It Don't lie, but lie. Don't kill, but kill under these conditions. Don't exaggerate, exaggerate under these conditions. Don't slander, but slander under these conditions. So Islam violated all the Ten Commandments. How can they survive with, with Christians and Jews? When they violated all the Ten Commandments, they can't. They have to be killed. They go conquer, they conquer uh, Jerusalem. How do they erase the memory of their, of the enemy, of their enemy that made a mockery of Islamic values? Because the mere existence of Jews and the Ten Commandments and the Temple. The mere existence of the Ten Commandments make Islam look bad. What do they do? They go on top of the holiest of the holy part of Judaism and build their own mosque there. And in their mind, they think that the memory of the Jews is gone. Now they can lie as much as they want. And this is what I wrote to expose that Islam has the opposite values of the Ten Commandments. It has the opposite values of the Bible. And it's not just Islam that has opposite values of the Bible. The left and communism and leftism, Saul Alinsky's values are exactly opposite to the Ten Commandments. That's why the left in America, they want to remove the Ten Commandments from all the courts. Why do you, do you think the left goes crazy when they see the Ten Commandments posted in courthouses in America? It's exactly the same way Muhammad viewed the Ten Commandments. We're all sinners is a biblical value. In Islam, no, no, no. We're not sinners. They are all sinners. Our enemies are all sinners. The Jews are all sinners. Non-Muslims are all sinners. Republicans are all, all sinners. Voters of Trump are all sinners. You get it? Yes. Judge the sin, not the sinners. That's a value in the, in the Bible. We don't judge the sinner. We judge the sin. Okay? Uh-uh. In Islam, you judge the sinner, not the sin, because murder can be allowed under certain conditions. Cheating can be allowed under certain conditions. 
lying can be allowed under certain conditions. So we can't judge the sin. We have to judge the sinner. And did they meet those conditions? And if they didn't, then they get that slam. Exactly. So the left in America today have the same value. They, they lie and steal and everything. They steal elections. They lie all the time. Do you see how they lie and the media lies? Because like Muhammad, I can, I can, everything is legal for me. I can violate all the Ten Commandments if it's for the benefit of my cause. <laughs> okay. And we keep talking about a narrative in the media and how it gets repeated. And we repeated. are afraid of That's Islam exactly when, when we have the left ruling over us. It's exactly like Islam. Communism and Islam are very similar in values because they all have a value system that, say, that says you can do anything, anything, kill, steal, uh, cheat, everything, if it's for achieving your own goal. Confession of sin, that's a biblical value. Confess your sin is a it's truly a biblical value. You go to your preacher, priest, and you confess your sin. That's a kind of cleansing of your soul. It yeah. makes you not repeat it again. In Islam, do you know, I listed in my book, you know how many times Muhammad said, says, conceal your sin, never admit your sin. I listed at least four or five Hadith by Muhammad that command Muslim to conceal their sin. If you admit your sin in Islam or confess your sin, you will be harshly punished and killed under Sharia. Wow. What, what a value, huh? Is this a value system you want to follow? To, under, I mean, under and, and that, would, that contradicts much of the West because we teach people you learn from your mistakes and if you can't admit your mistakes exactly you can't learn from them wow. exactly it's and it also takes out the guilt you don't want to deal with guilty people guilty people can be dangerous because eventually they pour their guilt and and they they on on their enemy they project their own guilt on their enemy yes and that's that's how, why Israel is always blamed for everything in the Middle East. And don't ever believe that the left in America is very different from Islam. They project their guilt. They steal the election, but they, they accused Trump for four years that he stole the elections with the help of Russia. Okay? Don't, don't just blame Islam. You have a government in America today that's following the same value system. Yeah. Saul Alinsky tells people to accuse the, your enemy of what you are guilty of. Exactly. And, and I that wrote is, an that's part of the I game. Wrote, exactly. I wrote an article. It's the first article ever written comparing Islam and Saul Alinsky. And it says the, the, the title of the article is Alinsky. Islam and radical roots. They both share the same radical roots. So I'm not just afraid of Islam. At least Islam, the people who follow it, they don't, they don't know any better. They don't have anybody to tell them. There's biblical values here. They have no idea about biblical values. They have, when I lived in Egypt, I never knew anything about the Bible. Never heard of it. Never had the Bible. I didn't know what biblical values are. I learned it when I came to America. But the people in the left in America who follow these values are worse than Muslims. Trust me. You know why? Because they know better. They were wow. all brought up with biblical values, including Saul Alinsky, who dedicated his book to Lucifer. Yes. 
so they know better. I'm oh, now more scared of the left, of the leftists, the globalists, and the communists. I'm more scared of them than I am scared of Islam because they know better. They were living under biblical values and they rejected it. And today, get, many of the Muslims don't have that opportunity un, unless a Christian walks up to them and uh, and presents what is factually true. I mean, they're t told so many deceptions about uh, Islam as well. I mean, about what Christians believe. It, and it's kind of amazing when I, my, my encounters with Muslims have been trying to get through the deceit that they are taught. And that's kind of difficult. They don't know that they are doing deceit. That's the difference between the left in America today and Muslim. When I lived under Islam, deceit is so much inside the Islamic culture and inside their value system that when you do, do it, it's not, it's part of your nature. It took me a long time to get rid of that habit in me. I, I used to forgive the seat like it's normal. Because I have, to, I have to protect Islam. So I have to be, it came naturally. It came na comes naturally to you. It doesn't come, it's not like a plan that you do to, to commit the seat. It's, it's an obligation. Yes. Lying in Sharia. If you open the Sharia book and you open the chapter, the, the part about lying, it says lying is an obligation for a Muslim. If, that right out if, of Reliance if, the Traveler, people. <laughs> if it's the, for the benefit of Islam. So when you feel that lying is an obligation, it becomes a duty. It becomes an honorable thing to do. Thus, after 9-11, you get Muslims on TV and you ask them, what is jihad? And they say, jihad doesn't mean violence. <laughs> totally believe it. They're sincere. In their mind, they're sincere. That's why it's very difficult to it's very difficult to convince a Muslim because you're speaking to somebody who's convinced while he's lying that he's honorable. He has no guilt whatsoever. By the way, the FBI knows that when you, inter when you have a lie detector test with a Muslim, they all pass while they're lying. Because inside them, they sincerely feel they are not lying. They feel the justification to lie that it is part of, so how can part of their you faith structure. How and, can you convince that to somebody? Impossible. That's a really good question. By <laughs> the way, read my, when you read my book, because yes. I put all the references for that. I don't have my book with me now. now uh, wholly different. Because I was shocked when I saw, because I always believed that, how can a Muslim fail a lie detector test when in their heart, they feel they are convinced that they are doing the right thing. They, they, they have no conflict inside them when they're saying it. But they Somebody. pass, they pass the test. I'm amazed when I think about it. I, mean, I I wrote about social norms. You wrote the you wrote the opposing values, which I, I love. I have to say that I'm I'm I will never cease to be amazed about the vast void between um well, it, the truth of the matter is that the, the void exists between Christianity and leftist Islamist is uh, not Islamist it's Islam as a whole. There is no middle ground. It's a huge, huge void in between. And it's, you know, if you're coming from a Judeo-Christian background, the, 
I guess the hardest thing for me was the difference between the concept of growing up in a, in a family that loves each other and a family that has a value of hate. Um, to me, that was, that's probably the most difficult thing to comprehend. And I think that is, I think for many people, when, when you start looking at all the little things that get built on, deceit is okay, um, uh, sinning is okay. Uh, there are so many little things you and I have picked at. Um, control, self-control is not okay. <laughs> we can control others like you say. There's a whole but, bunch yeah, of little like, things. Uh, I have uh, a list in my book of, of about maybe 50 something, 60 differences that yes. I sent you and you, yes. you read it and uh, I, can, I can list you. I have a whole chapter on how Islam views sin and how Islam views sin, how the West views love and how Islam, the word love does not exist in the Quran. Oh, that, that's one I didn't know. Thank you. The word love does not, the only time it was mentioned, it was about how, how God does not love the kafir. Oh. That's so the no, only time. There's no sense of, of, of a, the concept of a of greater love, deity the, having a sense of feeling towards man. The hmm. concept of love does not exist in the Quran except in what in a few verses where where Allah says I hate that I do not love the kafir and because I do not love the kafir I hate the kafir so you must you Muslims must hate the kafir too wow so God loves us all under under the biblical values God loves all of humanity, all of his creation. That is a concept that does not exist in the Bible, in the, in the Quran. In the Quran, yeah. So wh while God loves us all in, in, the, in the Bible, under Islam, Allah hates non-Muslim. And because he hates all non-Muslims, all Muslims must do the same thing. So, in the Bible, Al God has no human enemies. The Christians are born with a concept that doesn't exist in Islam, that their God has no human enemies. In Islam, when I was a Muslim, my God, my Allah had human enemies. And those human enemies, because they're the enemies of Allah, I must have them as my enemies as well. And I must kill them because Allah will use my hand through a concept called jihad to kill his human enemies. So that is a basic difference between the Bible and the Quran. The concept of love and enemies and human enemies that I must kill. And, and for those listening, if you haven't been paying attention, we have uh, a president who, while he was running for president, he called on Islam to commit acts of jihad, specifically mentioning the hand. <laughs> So again, the left and yes, Islam the are bound yes, together. Right. Yes, I I sat there and uh, I have to say I laughed through that. On, um, I mean, what do you expect with a man who has dementia running uh, running the, co the country? But yeah, well, they give they give him the verse to read. That's all. They <laughs> I'm still Some, waiting uh, for, for Harris to take over. <laughs> uh, well, Harris is uh, not as much brighter anyway. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's the scary thing. Yeah. I want to say thank you for joining us. Um, I definitely have to have you back. I think the, there is Absolutely. great importance in the work that you are 
doing. Um, and if please tell people how they can contact you as, as well, because I would or and, and follow your work to me that that work, this work that you're doing right now is so important. Well, uh, Paul, I'm honored to be with you on your show, and I'll be with your show on your show again anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, contact me on my email, nani.darwish at gmail.com. N O N I E dot D as in David, A R W I S H dot com uh, at, at gmail.com. And uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, so contact me anytime. Also, if you want to watch my, some of my interviews, just go on YouTube and put Nani Darwish and you'll see some of my, uh, my books are, uh, also on, uh, Amazon. I have four books. Uh, I suggest for the topic we were just discussing to get my book wholly different why I chose biblical values over Islamic values. Thank you. I have to have you back soon. And Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. All right. So next up, I have Leo Homan, formerly of Sharia Crime Stoppers. And with any luck on my part, and of course, God's blessings, maybe a partner in things to come on this show. It's been a while since I asked Leo to join us. So let me get this going straight off because he, that when we get together, we, we just talk and we have a great time. So here's how this interview went. Sure. For, sure. for those of you who have never heard of Leo Homan's work, let me say right now, you need to go to Leo Homan, L-E-O-H-O-H-M-A-N-N.com and go through his works. Leo's writings are based on his love of Christ and his love of truth. I often find myself wondering how he seems to be writing my thoughts. <laughs> uh, so welcome to the Sutliffian Report, Leo. Thanks for having me, Paul. I'm very much pleased to be here with you. It's been a while since we've uh, shared some airtime together. Yeah, thank you. Your, your work, Corporate Media Giant, tries to get a tiny Christian college banned from the NCAA Athletics. You yeah. won't believe why it lit, lit, lit a fire in my heart. You know, you point out that USA Today attacked Oral Roberts University by mocking and ridiculing the school in a hateful editorial meant to tarnish what was a brilliant moment for the Golden Eagles men's basketball team in advancing to the Sweet 16 of the NCAA tournament. What was USA Today's problem with Oral Roberts University? Well, uh, apparently they quoted uh, directly from the Oral Roberts student handbook all sorts of things, uh, Paul, about uh, the school's, you know, archaic rules and harsh mandates. Well, number one, no student would go there if they weren't comfortable with the quote unquote harsh mandates. <laughs> Exactly. Which, which simply state that, uh, among other things, you won't marry a person of the same sex. Um, you won't cross dress. If you're a male, you won't wear makeup. You know, if, if you're a female, you won't put uh, on male clothing and maybe uh, have a surgery to remove your breasts. Uh, you know, these are, <laughs> it's really if it weren't so sad, it would actually be comical because these are things that everyone would take for granted up until the last few years with the whole transgender mania. And obviously these students feel a calling to go to ORU uh, for the very reason that that stuff is in their handbook. Um, they don't want to study in an environment where people don't know what their biological sex is, where, uh, people are confused about who they should marry, uh, someone of the same sex or someone of the opposite sex, or maybe someone of no gender at all. Um, this is the type of insanity uh, that USA Today is engaging in when they write a column like this. I, I'm just going to interject that I chose to go to Roberts Wesleyan College. And you know, that's back in the 80s, and they they had a statement about homosexuality. They had a statement about several different things. Mm -hmm. 
you know, no drinking, things like that. And, and you know, that's that's it. You you choose which school to go to, and if those people, ha- you know, uh, follow their choice, um, it's crazy. I mean, what's wrong with the people having their choice? Yeah, I, I I don't understand what would be wrong with it. But these people obviously think in different strange ways. Uh, you know, like I said in the article, if you want to do these things, you know, if, if you're homosexual and you want to marry someone of the same gender, or if you're trans uh, gender and you're confused about whether you're a man or a woman, even though you apparently are unable to look at your own genitals and find out. Uh, but if you fall into one of these categories, there are literally thousands of of colleges and universities who would not only encourage your perversion and your twisted mind, but they would rush you to the front of the enrollment line because for them, that's a way to virtue signal, right? That's what's really become common in this uh, cancel culture that we live in. All of the politically correct universities, schools, corporations, uh, government agencies, they want to virtue signal to the left that they are uh, holier than thou and meet the new standard of morality, which as a Christian, you and I know they've twisted it around to where immorality is seen as moral in their eyes and more and, and morality as we would see it is seen as immoral in their eyes. So it's a direct uh, twisting of the truth, which is what Satan always does, right? Oh, you know, in, in truthfulness, it, without calling it twisting, we could simply say it's a lowering of the bar. <laughs> that, I think, would be an understatement. Yes, it, we can <laughs> safely say it is lowered the bar about as low as it can go. I, I think that is the holy of the truth. Um, and and we're you... not even saying that, you know, what what's so disgusting is that, you know, there's one or two, what, maybe a handful of schools who have strict rules like this uh it's just the the christian universities and the jewish universities they they choose i mean as a as a student i as a kid high school kid i watched my my cousin go to uh, a state university brockport state university and spend more time at our house sleeping than she did at the college because she kept getting kicked out of her room so her neighbor so her roommates could have sex (laughs) right that's what yeah exactly good point so there's you know, just innumerable com- opportunities, innumerable opportunities for a student who wants that type of environment, you know, this free sex, open sex type environment, they, they can, like I said in the column, they can knock, literally knock themselves out and go to all these, have their choice of these thousands of schools, but let there be a handful, maybe I'm just guessing a dozen or if we're lucky, we might be able to find two dozen in the entire country. I, I think we're closer to a hundred, uh, uh, closer to a hundred schools within the United States. They're so small, a few they're dozen, small amounts. A few dozen, right. A few dozen in the entire United States that a, cho- uh, that a is that include Jewish and Christian? Yeah, I would say Jewish, prim- Jewish and Christian schools, I would say. So um, if you're Christian, you would have less than that to choose from. And if you're Jewish, you would have less than that to choose from. Oh, yes, from. yes. So I, let's I think say it's maybe 20 in the whole, whole yeah, U.S. A, let's that. just, for the sake of argument, say it's approximately half and half. And so if you're Christian or if you're Jewish, you might have around 50 schools, give or take, uh, to choose from. But in the eyes of USA Today, that's too many. You should have none to choose from. That is the world that these people live in, if you're an editor or a publisher at USA Today, which, by the way, is the largest publisher of local newspapers in the country. Gannett Gannett News Services, yeah. Gannett Um, News Service, correct. Have you ever in your life seen a major newspaper insult a university when they did not cheat? Yeah, I mean, when they yeah. win a tournament, they win a tournament. I mean, they get, get to a level of the tournament, they win. And I've never, have you ever seen them get insult the university? I mean, I understand when they're cheating, but. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I have never once seen this. It's a first for me, but I guess we should not be surprised given the fact that everything these days has been politicized. And let's face it, 
this handful of universities, whether they be Christian or Jewish, that still holds to these traditional values, they are going to be seen as the political enemy uh, of these insane neo-Marxists who run the other universities. And whereas in the past, a neo-Marxist who ran a major university or a major newspaper chain might hold their tongue when they see a small college that holds uh, traditional values, which they see as antithetical to their values. In the past, as recently as six, seven, eight years ago, they would have held their tongue and said, well, you know, we'll, we'll at least pretend like we're congratulating them, even though they hated them. That is not the case anymore. The, the gloves have come off, the fangs have been bared, and the left is coming after us. I love to tell fellow Christians this. I still think most of us are living in a dream world of six, seven, eight years ago, and we don't realize, Paul, just how vicious this enemy is, and they will stop at nothing uh, to uh, get their way, get their agenda, and they will run over anyone in the process. If anybody had told me it was going to be like this, 10 years ago, I would have laughed in their face and never believed it. Right. Um, especially with what's going through the house. You mentioned how these mm. insults are connected to the same mindset that pushed in past HR5, the House um, House of Representatives, number five, the Equality Act in the House of Representatives. Leo, what will HR5, the Equality Act, do to those who love their freedoms under the U.S. Constitution? Well, it's exactly the same mindset at work uh, here, Paul. This intolerant uh, mindset. They call it the Equality Act, but that is an Orwellian term. The left loves to use Orwellian terms to uh, as titles for everything. So they call it the Equality Act, but it is really, in reality, the Inequality Act. Because what it does is it gives special rights and privileges to some, and it takes away rights and privileges from others. Uh, the other, in this case, as defined by the Equality Act, is again the traditional Bible-believing Christian or Jew who, uh, let's say in the case of, you know, baking the cake for the, uh, the couple getting it married in a gay marriage, uh, that gentleman, I don't remember his name, out in Colorado, he said that he would bake any cake for this gay couple that they wanted. The only cake he would not bake for them is one that congratulated them on what? Their marriage. Because he did not believe in same-sex marriage. He not only didn't believe it, it went in it, he went against his uh, very closely held religious beliefs. As, as a devout Christian. So you can see how the inequality, I mean, I keep calling it the inequality act because that's what it is, but the, <laughs> the, equal, the equality act would, for, would take away his freedom of choice to not bake that cake for the gay marriage. Uh, but then at the same token, it would give special rights and privileges to other people based on what? The color of their skin, the, uh, their, their sexual identity, uh, their religious beliefs. Uh, if you're a minority uh, in a minority of religious beliefs in this country, say you're a Muslim, notice how they treat them differently than other religions. Yes. The, the, the left doesn't go into the Muslim bakery and say, I want you to bake me a cake for my gay wedding. Well, they might get killed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but more than likely, they just don't want to go there because right now they are allied with the Muslims and they are pushing the same agenda against the Christians and the Jews. So they don't want to offend an ally in the culture wars. And in, 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 I do believe, I don't know what you think, but uh, I do believe that these two forces, if it were just the communists we had to deal with, or if it was just the Muslims we had to deal with, uh, we could be, we could deal with that. Yes. But the two are, the two are teaming up together against us and they, they forged this alliance, some call it the red green axis, uh, against, uh, the constitution of the United States and against the Christian moral 
underpinnings of the Constitution. But if we ever see the day where they are able to completely rid this country of Christianity, uh, meaning any influence of Christianity, we know there will always be Christians. Uh, but what they're trying to do is destroy whatever little bit of influence the Christians still have in this country. And once they accomplish that, if they're successful, I do believe they will turn on each other. What about you? Um, and, and hands down, sadly, it would be um, a win for the Muslims. There is no chance of the commies because they have told everybody to get rid of their guns. And you know, good commies, would, you know, unless you're, uh, you're expecting people to protect you, so you're having your, your people that are around you protect you, and they're allowed to have guns but only while they're working. <laughs> so if you don't have guns and your enemy does, uh, you're eliminated. <laughs> Many of these lefties do have guns now. Antifa has armed up. Uh, even just an, a lot of mainstream Democrats, I know for a fact, uh, Democrat women especially, uh, have, have gotten arms over the... Do you realize there's been 8 million first-time gun owners over the last, over during 20, the year 2020, wow. there was over 8 million first time gun owners. And most of those, the majority of those, I think about 60% have been women. Uh, and it's not just Republican women. I've, I've actually been surprised uh, to research into that topic. And so, uh, but I agree with you. If it were a face off between the two, I'd probably put my money on the Muslims. However, do you want to hear my theory? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I don't think either one of them is going to win. Uh, I think the real threat, the most fierce, they're both, they're all real threats, but the most fierce threat that we face as free Americans and any free person in the Western world and, and for the, the entire world for that matter, the, uh, the ultimate threat is one world government and I don't think that one world government is going to be communist or Muslim. I think it's going to be run by the technocratic globalists. Uh, the, the, some people will call it the call them the uh, the cabal. You know, the international uh -huh. cabal. Uh, people like, uh, interestingly, they're mostly white and male. You know, uh, people like Bill Gates, George Soros, Warren Buffett. Uh, and they're also interestingly into heavily into depopulation measures. Yes. And so I do think China is the, is the closest we have to a model of what they want to bring in. And while China is known as is run by the Communist Party, it's not really pure communism. It's sort of uh, they call it state capitalism. Some people call it state capitalism or uh, stakeholder capitalism, uh, the Great Reset with the World Economic Forum, I believe, is the main uh, influencer in this regard. They're 100 percent on board with what they call stakeholder capitalism. Yeah, the uh, world, they also, yeah this yes. is the push of the World Economic Forum, correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And the Great Reset. And uh, China is the model. Uh, you can get rich in China, even if you're not really a high up uh communist party member as long as you play ball with the communist party uh follow all of its rules edicts laws uh you can get rich in china uh you'll have no real freedom of of speech but you can make a lot of money you have no freedom of expression freedom of speech you don't have freedom of religion either and that's why i think the muslims uh if they were ever to be if they were to ever cease to be useful to these people, they would be rounded up and put in concentration camps like they are in China. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. They, they are, uh, I mean, there is a genocide going on in China of Muslims. I mean, it's, yes. that's not even a question. Yes. They are looking at it as, uh, they're not looking at, at it like it's being looked at here where, the the end the enemy of my enemy is my friend. They don't look at that. They look at these people. They look at Muslims as a danger to their way of life. Yes, and because the Muslims aren't needed there, the people don't have guns. Uh, that's another freedom, uh, by the way, that you won't have in the new Great Reset. Uh, 
They don't want any Second Amendment. Uh, just everybody uh, follow the rules. And if you're in good graces with the, uh, the authorities, according to your social scoring, uh, if you high, if you have enough so high enough social score, you'll be able to uh, work uh, a job for a large corporation. There'll be very few thriving small businesses. I don't think there's too many of those in China. Uh, you'll have no say over where you go to college, if you go to college, uh, where you uh, are allowed to work. Uh, you'll have to show your papers everywhere. Uh, that's why they want these vaccine passports. And my they governor are, is dumb enough to push it. They are absolutely using COVID to push that agenda. These people are into A, depopulation, as we already stated, and B, identifying, tracking, and tracing every human being on the planet. And you can, and if you haven't seen what, I mean, this used, New York State for a long time was the kingdom of Andy. Uh, he has been dethroned, <laughs> and we have our legislature again, so we no longer have King Andy and the Kingdom of Andy. We are back to being a state because Andy couldn't keep his his zipper up, is what it comes down right. to, or his hand to himself. <laughs> or his hands in place, right. Yes. So, you know, and well, Kingdom he, of he Andy is in now place, defunct. But he didn't keep them to, them, to himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the... That is still that we are dealing with a media who doesn't want to talk about the numerous hundreds of maybe thousands of senior citizens his choices yes. led to the death of. My father had, I was not allowed to touch my father for a year oh my in New York State. My father's in his 80s and we're now at the point where he's, you know, dementia has taken place and I can thank King Andy for taking my valuable time with my dad where you know I, I I used to go and see him every uh every week and go that out we, is... we'd enjoy and now I mean for for months on end I'm not I have not been allowed to join to do that um it's only and now he's in so he's the guy who's been vaccinated and um then he ended up needing to go to the hospital because he fell and they gave him over three days they gave him three COVID tests and I don't see how this is not a medically abusive. I really don't. But it's mentally is, and emotionally abusive. Yes. Yes. And this is what, you know, living in the kingdom of Andy in what is now again, New York state. Um, I'm questioning these things. So like you, I file FOIAs. <laughs> and uh, I, I actually asked for the FOIA for um, any evidence that existed before the mandate in New York state for masks. I says any scientific evidence to prove that COVID-19 would be stopped by masks. And they did not have any to send me. They, in fact, they told me it existed on the CDC site. I said, and they sent me a link, again, to a CDC site that was created in November of this year. <laughs> so it says, okay, first From of all, you're sending- From what I understand that if it's the same study that they're referring to that I looked at a uh, month or- it, it, the news came out about it only about a month ago. I don't yeah. know. May, maybe it was completed in November. I don't know. Well, this uh, one, this one talks about water droplets. Is that what yours does? The one you're talking about? Uh, this one, they, they, it was the most exhaustive study done on masks. And oh, that they one. Found, and this is the CDC, mind yes. you. Yes. They found that it only made a one, a yes, less than a, a less than a two percent, <laughs> less than two percent, like one at the highest, it was like one point eight percent. Yeah. Uh, and then the, oh tell everybody what the title of that study is. It's I don't masks remember. are effective. Yes, that's right. And the and the and the media ran with that narrative. Yeah. They did they, most effective. most most of them never gave the percentage. One one percent to 1.8 percent uh <laughs> slowing the spread they didn't mention that term that that number all they said was masks work yes look at this study so i'm 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 active on social media and somebody shared this on linkedin and i look at it <laughs> and and um so i start sharing it and you know it, it's kind of disappeared but let me say when i put that out and i shared it because i i'm I've got a lot of good connections on LinkedIn. I, I think when people find out some of this truth, I mean, I've been talking to 
a lot of people who are influenced by the fear networks. Um, yes. And, you know, I say that, well, you're insisting we wear a mask. Do you know that's, you know, they say, well, CDC says it's important and it's good. I says, do you know that the CDC says uh, it's only your mask that you've been told that you must wear is only one to 2% effective according to the study that was just released. Right. I'm like what? <laughs> right. And, and that the droplets, the, the viral droplets, I understand are five times smaller than the holes in your cloth mask. I mean, it gets even better. The, um, the, I mean, this is what we tell, I tell people, according to what I've been told from medical experts, if you can smell your farts, you can get COVID through your mask. <laughs> right. Right. So, oh, my goodness. It is really a shame how stupid people have become in this country. Well, I, because of that, let's get into the cancel culture article you just uh, wrote. And I can't think of a better a better uh, way to segue to get this into this because we're talk. I, I can't think of anything else to call cancel culture but stupid. But I, I, I uh, detest the censorship. I mean, we're writers. We the concept of being censored is is really repugnant to us. Um, yeah. In your newest article, you point out that cancel culture has already found a platform in our kids' schools today. I'm a retired teacher. I saw it coming, and I just retired uh, this, this beginning of this year. So I should say the end of last year. Um, what does cancel culture, this stuff, that the platform that, the, that's now in schools today, what does that look like for the, you know, for the parents? What, do they, what can they look for to be concerned about? One of the things they should look for is this word equity. Uh, if they see terms like equity, inclusiveness, diversity, those things, those terms, those words all sound very good to the average American ear because we're a country that respects equality, equal justice under the law. It, that's, that's the American way, right? But that's not what these terms mean to the left. Uh, I illustrate with a graphic, which I think is even better than words in this article, exactly what they mean by equity. Uh, it's not equality. Equality means that we treat everybody the same, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their religion, religious affiliation, uh, their sexual identity. Uh, that's not the American way. Even Martin Luther King Jr., in the civil rights mo movement said that a man should be judged not by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. character. So I'm all for that. And I think most Americans are all for that, whether they're conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican, whatever, uh, black, white, whatever. Uh, but that's not what these neo-Marxists who are running the school systems are talking about when they refer to equity, uh, racial equity. Let's start with that. They, if you read their papers and read their uh, documents, what they mean by that is every decision that's made in the school system, in the local government, in the local government agency that's applying racial equity, every decision that is made is made, quote, through the lens of race. Which makes uh, them racist. <laughs> at, it, by my definition, that would make you a uh, class A racist. Exactly. Um, but they don't see it like that. They see equity as helping the disadvantaged. And if you, uh, I don't know if you can see this graphic. If I, well, I, I've, I can put can the graphic that? up. Yeah. I've actually seen the graphic used in schools. Yes. In uh, Black Lives Matter training materials. And I thought yes. that was uh, shocking when I saw it the first time. Now, I, I think the first time I saw it is actually two years ago. I was, I was appalled then. Um, and nothing I could do could communicate how it was offensive. And that, you know, of course, I refused to teach this stuff. So mm -hmm. I was actually sent to a room. So I wasn't allowed to teach during Black Lives Matter. Day. Really? Yes. Unbelievable. They paid but me yet, to do nothing. But yet very believable. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's already in the schools with the uh, this equity program, which uh, serves to punish the high achievers, 
and give special rights and privileges to the lower achievers. It t- that's what it tends to do in order to, quote, level the playing field. Again, this is their words, not mine. Yes. Um, it's already playing out, as you know, in the schools in terms of race and gender and sexuality and all of that. Um, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Um I mean, it's going so far as they're changing our history. They're changing yeah. what we teach. Yeah. Um, I think you actually go into more details on the cancel culture with Islam, which I was, I'm sorry, I did not. We'll have to do another interview just for that other part of the article, because I I personally am amazed by that piece. I think I'll call you back and, and ask for another uh, interview just for that, because th- that is, yeah, that is powerful. Leo, you're saying that Marxists, the one who love communism and socialism, the ones who love an oppressive government le- that leads to, le- they're led by dictators and um, re- they want to and want to remove the concept of freedom under the government is now a major influence in our schools today. That's what you're saying, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my these, gosh. Are, they are, these are neo Marxists, whether they know they're neo Marxists or not. They adhere to the basic principles of cultural Marxism, uh, which is to, once they get into our major institutions, especially the education system and the media, uh, they don't use violence. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think most people would agree is what neo, what makes up neo-Marxism. They don't really, they're not always calling for a violent overthrow of the government like the traditional Marxists. They would rather get in there and infiltrate from within and 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 overturn all of the uh, Judeo-Christian principles uh, that our Constitution is based on, uh, because the the real enemy to these folks uh, is the Constitution and Christianity. Those are the two things that they absolutely must defeat, must must smash into smithereens if they're ever going to completely take over this country. They know that. And in so, order to smash the Constitution, they have to convince people that Christianity is wrong because you can't yes. smash the Constitution without smashing Christianity because the, the whole the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, if you go through them by, with, a, with a fine-tooth comb, you can find it is entirely based on Scripture. And I, I'm sad and sorry that many people do not, in many schools don't teach us today. It's one of the, the sickest things I think that's resulted from the removal of God from the curriculum. Um, I, I want to Absolutely. S- You're absolutely right. It's, it's and, uh, shocking. Yeah. I, as a high school, as, as a college kid, I took a class called, at a church called the U.S. and the the u.s constitution and the bible and one of our professor one of the guy who taught it was actual college professor of history and he was so excited to share this because it's been on his heart um and you know it was a dr phil giles that put that class together and i still remember loving every piece of that but i you know as as a person who became a teacher a little later on i'm still marveling that we do not teach these concepts in school. In fact, we are basically forbidden from doing that. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know how you made it as long as you did, Paul. <laughs> oh, you would like what I taught my last year in regard, because I have to teach religion. You would love what I had to teach on um, Islam. That I got away with teaching my last year. <laughs> I'll say. Um, I want to say, um, since this is a Christian news show, Leo, I, I would like to give the listeners something they can do with the information you've been giving us today. What should freedom lovers, patriots, and Christians and Jews do to counter all these negative, dangerous influences on our children? That's always the the big question, isn't it? At the end of every show, I come on, and all I can say is they need to be more involved. I mean, Uh, They need to learn these terms. They need to learn the difference between equity and equality. Uh, They need to know what the teachers are teaching their children, not just what's in the textbook, because sometimes that isn't as bad. It it can be awful, but it's not always as bad as what uh, lesson plans the teacher is downloading from the Internet. Uh, And so they need to be uh, fully engaged with their children's education or get them the heck out. 
Uh, in fact, that's probably where I would be at right now if I had children in school. This school system, these public schools, uh, Paul, are, in my estimation, my honest opinion, a lost cause. Um, unless you can completely take over the local school board with uh, uh, people by electing people with a Christian, traditional Christian worldview, forget it. I mean, there's just no way to rein these people in at this point. They control everything from the school board to the principal's office, to the superintendent's office, to most of the teachers. Uh, there may be a few good ones in there, but they're being rooted out as we speak. Uh, so get your kids out of there unless you have a really solid plan to replace your entire school board. And, you know, I don't know of too many school boards in this country that are uh, majority Christians uh, or even just majority solid constitutional uh, patriotic Americans. School boards tend to be dominated by Democrats and rhinos. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why that is, but I've found that to be the case. Uh, you may not know this, but before I started writing uh, for national publications, I worked in local newspapers for 29 years. And so, you know, I covered these boards, uh, city councils, county commissions, and local school boards. Uh, it's usually the dumbest people in the county <laughs> that get elected to these positions. Oh, my father would sit here laughing. He taught for 35 years. And yes, I can't tell you how much he would be in agreement with your description of this. They're, either, they, they're either smart but leftist. Yes. Or they're, or they're just regular Americans. They're apolitical. They're, not really, they're, not, they're just middle of the road people, but they're, they have low IQs. They're not, uh, they're not informed in general. And that's, exactly. Yeah. They're, ig ignorant is a better word than low <laughs> IQ, right? Because yeah. you could be high IQ, but still be ignorant. The root word of ignorant is what? Ignore. Yes. And so you're the type of person who ignores certain facts because it's not politically expedient to uh, look at those facts. And, and, and those I, are the type of people that tend to get elected to school boards. And I'll give you an example real quick before I have to close this out. Um, I, as a teacher, I tried to get a textbook removed because it had misinformation that promoted Islam and promoted terrorism. Uh, and I was able to point out over 20 errors wow. within a few pages of just a section on Islam. Wow. So, you know, I'm okay with them telling all the teachers, you know, we have to replace it with this material. Okay, then we don't have to replace the book. But to mandate to the teachers that this has to be taught versus what's in the book, that would be better. Again, um, so I proposed this. I showed the issues. I, I made a video of it. Um, I actually have another textbook that we, I reviewed with a, a Meccan Muslim. Now, he's a... I have never encountered anybody who just believed Muhammad when he was a Mecca. We really doesn't consider him much of a person, much less. Uh, it's it's an interesting statement. This guy is more anti-jihad than um, I am, which wow. which was shocking. Um, Saeed Shabi. Now, if you ever get a chance to meet him, I'd love to introduce him to you, Leo, because I think you would have a, a fun time with him. Uh, he's an interesting person. But he tore up this textbook worse than I ever would have. Um, he's of the opinion that this is that this is an advanced placement textbook. Is not he would he would probably call it criminal mm. because uh, the dangers that I mean putting this in the quote best of the best students' hands. It, he his belief was that this would empower them to embrace the Islamic terrorist narrative. And in not just become sympathizers, but again, embrace it. And that's scary. I, I said these, I've, now that one, um, we did uh, an ex expose. We put it out. I actually sent it to the publisher. I, you know, I've done multiple things with this. I've had, I sent it out to uh, several people who, who had the influence possible to, possibility to do something. Um, New York State Regents. You could hear the crickets. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so again, this we get people in these positions who who ignore what is important. Right. Who are incredibly 
accurate there. Oh, wow. Um, Leo, please tell everybody how they can follow your work. And, and um, I mean, I, I know I gave the website, but please, can they please tell them how they can follow you? Sure. Uh, it's leohoman.com. L-E-O is my first name and last name Homan is spelled H-O-H-M-A-N-N uh, dot com. Uh, they can find me on Facebook at the Homan Report. Um, I've been kicked off of Twitter <laughs> uh, for being too outspoken about the vaccine issue, I guess. That's when it started. Um, and they can. I'm on Gab at Leo Homan. I'm on Parlor at Leo A. Homan, um, and that's about it. Um, I still have some copies of my book that I'm offering on my website, Stealth Invasion. Uh, it's also on, it's been republished and reissued in paperback on Amazon. <laughs> wow. So our yeah. book, before I forget, our books were, were reviewed in the same scholarly magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and I am been I've been asked to do a second edition, so I find this fascinating. Awesome! Um, yeah, my book is now in demand again because it really wasn't during the Trump years. Because my book is about the uh, Islamic invasion through using immigration. Yes, uh, and, and that slowed to a trickle during those four years of Trump, so people weren't really interested in the issue anymore. Well, now uh, Katie bar the door, <laughs> they are being they're coming in across the border illegally and they're going to be you know just coming in in a flood a tidal wave in terms of legal immigration and that's really what my book is about is how the globalists use illegal and legal immigration to flood our uh, borders open the borders and flood our western countries with these folks who hate us and don't want to assimilate to american values and so it's now uh back in going to be back in demand uh Post Hill Press has republished it in paperback. You can get it on Amazon there. I have a few hardback copies left, I think about 20, 25. And so people can get an autographed hardback copy by just contacting me through my website, uh, leohoman.com. Well, thank you, Leo. I'll have to have you back soon. God Absolutely. Bless. All right. All right. Wow. I, that interview. It was so powerful to me and say that Leo and I uh, bonded again. I think that uh, I'm always amazed how he's, his words, uh, he's, he's a much more prolific speaker than, uh, and writer than I am. And I'm always amazed at how he seems to be writing what I think. And so I encourage you to go to Leo Holman. That's L-E-O-H-O-H-M-A-N-N.com. And go through his his works. You will find some things that will personally resonate with you that will shock you. Um, that somebody's actually saying what you're probably thinking. Um, at least that's how I felt. And I am just want to encourage you to go find that and, and read his work. This week, uh, Todd Bensman, who was a regular on this show, had one of the most chilling stories the border crisis, uh, you know, the one thing that the Biden team refuses to admit exists, um, the border crisis. His article, and it was published yesterday, I consider it very important. It's titled, Charters and Greyhounds are delivering them where they want to go. Um, it's also been titled, Catch a Bus. Thousands of free border crossing immigrants are dispersing across America. So let me get into this again. It's by Todd Benzman. It was published yesterday by the Center for Immigration Studies. Todd writes, on a recent evening, with the night ahead looking long, an idling charter bus parked on a lot prepared to disperse a new kind of import throughout the American landscape. The bus and a small van nearby were packed with 60 or so mostly Haitian families fresh out of the Rio Grande from their illegal crossings. After testing negative for COVID and other processing, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security had given them legal documents and released them to a local non-governmental organization, the Val Verde Border Humanitarian Coalition. 
just blocks away from the river in this South Texas border town. For another day or so, coalition volunteers help them arrange to wire in money for bus tickets and lodging in the cities to which the buses will take them. Like at least 20 other buses that had each carried 50 people in just the first three weeks of March. This one soon rumbled onto the long road from this Texas border town, carrying happy, chattering passengers to new American lives in Orlando, Florida, Fort, La- Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach. Think about these things. As well as Newark, New Jersey. They feel happy because they're in the United States, said Lorenzo Ortiz of the Albuin San Martino Migr- Migrante Church, who helps coordinate the daily bus rides from Del Rio to where the new migrants say they want to go. They want to get as soon they want to get as soon as possible to their destination. They're all going to apply for asylum. They're all good people. The buses rolling in a steady daily succession out of Dol Rio. One charter a day, seven days a week, and before that, weeks of filling Greyhound buses represent a microcosm of a much broader aspect of the unfolding mass migration crisis at the southern border that has attracted limited media coverage and occurs largely outside public view. Tens of thousands of immigrants caught illegally crossing the border and then released under the new leniency policy of President Joe Biden are now dispersing to four corners of the United States on buses, with some of the more moneyed ones taking passenger jets. As best as the Center for Immigration Studies can determine from interviews and scattered media reporting, the buses are leaving regularly from Del Rio the Texas Rio Grande Valley communities, and Laredo. But the busing also appears to be going on in Arizona as well as in California. Where are these buses going? Up and drop their Haitian, Venezuelan, and Cuban passengers in Florida and New Jersey. Those from Nicaragua and other Central American nations have been delivered to Tennessee, Massachusetts, Indiana, Michigan, North Carolina, Georgia, Kentucky, in large cities in Texas, such as Dallas and Houston. Population importation by Greyhound and charter buses began in earnest here in Del Rio and from all major crossing points along the southern border shortly after President Biden took office. That's no coincidence, given the new president's first moves were to undo his predecessor, Donald Trump's Mexico COVID protection pushback to Mexico policies for minors and family units, and to end a deterring deportation machine that had been flying thousands home to Central America. In their place came a policy that, for the sake of descriptive simplicity, might be termed catch and bus. It appears for now to mainly be limited to families, though not always exclusively. Catch and bus developed when a flood of migrants began crashing over the border in Texas and Arizona in the expectation that the new Biden administration would follow through on campaign promises to let almost all illegal immigrants into the country and most deportations and provide a pathway to full citizenship. Immediately overwhelmed and unwilling to return children with their parents, Biden's DHS began handing out legal permission slips to pursue more permanent legal status later and put them on outward bound buses. This practice in turn only propelled the crisis because naturally it satisfied beneficiaries passed on word of the new catch and bus practice on social media networks and calls home. A kind of gold rush began over the frontier that has only gathered volume and intensity by the day. Jump to the switch of administrations, and we saw an immediate surge of 340, recalled Tiffany Burrell, Operations Director of Val Verde's County Border Humanitarian Coalition of one particularly bussy day, compared to the norm of about 25 a week. It's been a steady climb to where we are 100 or 150 a day now. They're all going into the United States. The initial spike in apprehensions of families and minors has attracted media attention. 
but much less so about their numbers, where in the country they are showing up, how they are getting there, and on whose dime. Think about that. Who's paying for these buses? They say the migrants are paying for them. Who's getting the buses there so they can pay? Who's making the money here? Hmm. Todd continues, some whose resources take special American Airlines flights out of this town's small international airport, according to Ortiz of El Buena San Martino Magrante. But buses like the ones in Del Rio carry the vast majority in a nonstop conveyor belt that is transporting a seemingly endless foreign population from their border town spigots through the nation's interior. U.S. Customs and Border Protection data provides some indication of how many immigrants and family units all this early stage of the crisis might have benefited from catching bus. The government has not disclosed the number of those granted the catch and bus privilege. But an early benchmarking number can be extrapolated from the CBP data that's public. The number of apprehended family units leapt from 4,000. 464 in pre-election October 2020 to 18,945 in February 2021 for a total of 39,061 for that early crisis time period. Limited reporting suggests that some 87% of all immigrants caught in family units during that time were not returned to Mexico, according to the An Axios report based on leaked CBP data showing that only 13% returned during one week in March. If, say, 87% are not returned, then the number of illegal entrants bussed around the United States during these months would come to about 34,000 people. That's probably just a start. There are strong indications from data leaked to to the Center for Immigration Studies and from anecdotal interviews on the, on the border that CBP's March figures will show a dramatic escalation on a skyward trend line that shows little sign of leveling off so long as word that catch and bus is still happening spreads across the globe and inspires many more to exploit it. Del Rio and its environs offer a respective, sorry, representative glimpse into how the process works on the ground, based on recent CIS reporting in the area. According to Ortiz Burrow, Border Patrol agents and several migrants, many turned themselves into Border Patrol voluntarily after their illegal crossings, knowing well the good things that will follow. They are taken to a Border Patrol processing facility on the outskirts of town where their fingerprints and identifiers are registered. In the first month of November, December, January, and February, no one was getting tested for COVID. But after the public outcry, DHS contracted a private company to conduct COVID-19 tests inside the Del Rio Border Patrol facility. Every immigrant is now tested, Burrow said. DHS then provides many immigrants with an administrative document entitled Order of Release on Recognition, on Recognizance, I'm sorry, which grants them the legal right to be present inside the United States. According to two such documents that immigrants on the bus agreed to share, these require the immigrants to self-report to a deportation officer in their destination cities by a specific date. One Nicaraguan migrant showed a Center for Immigration Studies uh, a document titled Interim Notice Authorizing Parole which grants him a renewable one-year term to live legally inside the country. Are you understanding what this is about? You know, you know what I'm curious about, I'm, I'm waiting to hear, while I, you know, I want you to think about, they're allowed to stay here. Are they then giving them permission to work in the United States? So 34,000 jobs are now going to be taken up. I mean, it's just what's already been into the country illegally. I mean, that's the minimum guess that we're just talking about the busing. Todd's article is really powerful. And, um, you know, you should be concerned when you think about this. Uh, What about those who are unemployed right now, who are American citizens? What about those who served this country with honor as veterans? 
do they get a chance at a job first? Or does the person who is now on parole as an illegal immigrant have that? I mean, again, they're not even called illegals anymore. They took that ability away when they say they're on parole. Again, can they work legally with that document? So what I'm there's nothing that sounds like they have a legal right to work. But again, is that what the intention is that they should be able to work and take the jobs of Americans? These are concerns. I mean, if should they get jobs before your veterans? This is stuff to be scared about and think about. Another part of the insanity of not putting our own citizens first over those who come here legally is being seen in California today. Alex Nestor of the Washington Free Beacon has a story on migrants being allowed to have in-person education. While in, again, we're talking about California. In California, Americans who were born in the United States are not allowed to be taught in person in California. (laughs) This came out March 30th. San Diego Unified School District teachers will provide in-person instruction for undocumented migrant children without reopening classrooms for other students in the district. The San Diego County Office of Education published a notice Monday asking for local teachers to participate in an in-person educational program for unaccompanied migrant girls who are being held in a convention center. Documented students enrolled in the San Diego public schools aren't scheduled to receive face-to-face instruction until April 12th. San Diego County Superintendent Schools of Schools, Paul Gotthold, said in the statement that children have a right to receive an education regardless of whether they are all children in California, regardless of immigration studies, a status have a constitutional right to education. All children. Okay. You notice the removal of the word citizen. Notice the removal of the word adult and parent. So children who are not citizens of the country have higher rights under this belief structure than your children who were born here. See, you end up paying through taxes for your education in various ways. And people who are not paying taxes now, and this is a whole other argument, but it should make you think. They would give the priority of in face-to-face instruction to people who are not citizens uh, and do so by justifying I, I'm I have questions. I'm a retired teacher. I personally hated teaching with Zoom. And you know, I, I have real issues with this. But again, this is, you know, I'm the retired teacher. I'm thinking from that narrative. How could we teach I mean I had a re, I was advising people to sue their local school districts because their child who has special needs is was now being denied what they were promised with their child's IEP, which is an individualized education program or a plan. The idea is that you are supposed to provide things for children, I mean, who have special needs by the law. That's that's important. But under these instructions, that was never going to happen. This stuff gets scary. And I'm in the middle of the circle of hell (laughs) in uh, where I'm trying to get. Oh, it's opening finally. Okay. So let me tell you the next thing, that the next piece of news that's kind of surprising. Um, If you're not paying attention to what's happening in Europe, we're heading over the the deep blue sea of the Atlantic, which which I call the pond. Many of us know, again, many of you know I'm, I'm a retired teacher. I was rather outspoken about the jihadi murder of Samuel Patty in France. And, and as I have shared repeatedly on this show, how teachers in France were required to teach about the concept of freedom of speech, and they now fear doing this. I have been required to teach about the concept of freedom of speech. Uh, every teacher in the United States who teaches a, a class in social studies ends up teaching this. Every person who, every teacher in Canada 
teaches this concept. But we're having problems in Europe. So this past week, Muslims in the UK threatened a teacher's life. Vivek Chowdhury of the Daily Mail shares how a teacher has been thrown under the bus by his school for doing paid to do. This is a surprisingly eye-opening piece. The father of the RE teacher at the center of, bl- of a blasphemy row of, after allegedly showing students a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad fears, says his son, fears he will be murdered and will never be able to return to his old life. The teacher in his 20s, who is not being named, has gone into hiding with his partner after receiving death threats. Speaking exclusively to Mail Online, his father said, my son keeps breaking down, crying, and saying it's all over for him. He's worried that he and his family are going to be killed. He knows that he's not going to be able to return to work or live in Bately. It's just like going to be too dangerous for him and his family. Look what happened to the teacher in France who was killed doing the same thing. Eventually, they'll get my son, and he knows this. His whole world has been turned upside down. He's devastated and crushed. When he starts speaking, he just breaks down and cries. He's been come an emotional wreck. He feels that everything is broken. And to be honest, it's hard to console him at the moment because that's the truth. I'm going to encourage you to go to dailymail.co.uk to read the article titled Teacher Tells Father Fears um, Father Fears Life, Prophet Muhammad wrote. Let me continue this article. The teacher also criticized Batley Grammar School for its handling of the incident. In the intermediate aftermath, the school suspended him and head teacher Gary, Gary Gibble apologized to parents for the inappropriate use of the cartoons taken from the French satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo. However, his father fumed. The school has thrown my son under a bus. The lesson that he delivered, in which the picture of the Prophet Muhammad was shown, was part of the curriculum. Are you hearing this? He was mandated to teach this lesson. He was told he had to teach this lesson. He was told he had to do this. That picture was part of the required curriculum. So this teacher is has his life threatened, and the school is pretending it doesn't know that he was required to teach this. Freedom of speech, people. Um, are we going to allow this to be taken here in the States as areas where Islam grows, it's being removed? France, they killed a teacher for doing this. Many teachers are have gone on public record saying they fear their ability to teach what is required. That's in France. Now in England, it's happening. In UK, it's happening. How many other countries in Europe where the Muslims have come in and started spreading their beliefs in Sharia? How many other schools, how many other teachers are afraid to teach Things like freedom of speech or freedom of expression. Uh, this this stuff bothers me because, yeah, because I'm a writer, because I was a teacher, because I love the concept of freedom and liberty. And to anybody else who loves the concept of freedom and liberty, it should bother you also. This piece uh, comes out of Germany. It, it's by Hanni Gorba. Uh, Hani works for the investigative project on terrorism. Uh, now, he wrote one incredible piece on radical Islam presenting a major security threat. Now, this piece is also an eye-opener, and it's speaking about certain sects in Germany. And we're going to talk about them partly – I picked this partly because when I was in Germany – Uh, Our guide pointed out this particular sect that they're going to be talking about in here and said, this is where the terrorists come from. I want you to think about that. Our guide 
wasn't a national security guy. He was just a he was a doctoral student. He was informed and he was able to translate German into English. But I would consider that, you know, understanding what the what's just normal to know. And here is a guy who's willing to share this stuff. And I, and I, I just I think about what's going on when when this stuff is out there in the public and, and the average person knows. That's what bothered me about being told these things. If the average person knows these things, why don't they do something? And uh, that was one of my problems when I was in Germany. They knew things were wrong. They knew things were bad. They knew certain places were dangerous influence and creating problems in their communities, but they did nothing. So this article starts out, the Islamization of European societies has been a long-term aim of Islamists. Okay, there's a problem I have with this word Islamists. You t there is no such thing as Islam separate from politics. Islam is Islam. Is the term Islamist means political Islam. Well, there is no Islam without politics. You ask a Muslim if it can be separated, they will tell you no. So that's my problem with the term Islamist. Now we're going to talk about the, quote, sect that everybody in Germany seems to know. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying they know that this sect called Salafi, uh, Salafis. When I was there, they were pointing out a Salafist mosque saying this is where the terrorists come from. Now, it wasn't just one mosque. There was two or three that they pointed out, and they were big. If the average person knows this and does nothing, if the, if, if the people who are the politicians and the people who do national security know this and do nothing, how can the people who live in the country be safe. It's not possible. And let's keep going. On February 25th, 850 police officers in Berlin and Brandenburg rounded, raided 26 locations tied to a Salafist group known as Jamatu Berlin. The translation is the Berlin Group. The Berlin Senate had banned the group's activities before the raid. After it was found to have ties to the Islamic State, used anti-Semitic slogans and called for the death of Jews, the group had contact with Anis Amri, the Tunisian terrorist and asylum seeker who drove a hijacked truck into a Berlin Christmas market in 2016, killing 12 people and injuring 48. Moroccan intelligence had warned German authorities about Amri's support for al-Qaeda's affiliate, Jabhat al-Nusra, prior to the attack. But the warning was ignored. Jamatu Berlin advocates terrorist attacks on civilians. And I'm hoping I can still be heard. I am not hearing myself just now. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So just checking. Um, having had my show destroyed last week by BTR. <laughs> All right. Let me keep going in this article. Jamaat 2 Berlin advocates terrorists attacked on civilians propagate a cult of martyrdom that increases the willingness and promote Islamic State ideology, said Berlin's Minister of Interior and Sports in a statement following the raid. The group reflects the principles of democracy and the rule of law, seeking instead to form a religious state governed by Sharia. Quote, we have no room for terrorism propagation or the glorification of the so-called Islamic State, unquote, said Berlin's Interior Ministry, Andreas Geisel, after the raid. The danger of Islamist terrorism remains high. Today's ban is another building block in the determined fight against violent extremism, unquote. A day later, a German court sentenced 37-year-old radical Iraqi cleric Ahmad Abdulaziz Abdullah to 10 and a half years to prison, in prison for being an Islamic State member and for terror financing in Germany. An estimated 1,060 people left Germany to fight with ISIS in Syria and Iraq, according to the German Interior Ministry. Salafism is a puritanical reform movement that aims to return Islam to its original roots. Oh, guess 
who else has that claim? The Muslim Brotherhood. Oh, you see how they agree? Isn't that what the Islamic State said it was? Hmm. How many places actually do... This is another question that should be asked. Hmm. I want to get back into this, but uh, I'm, I'm running out of time. I'm just going to advise you to go look up this article. Go to investigativeproject.org and read because some of this is just it's just too big for me to cover and try to get through all the news that I have ready today um, because the interviews I did were longer than I usually do. Let's talk about what's happened in Nigeria this week. Um, this is another sad, sorry tale. In Nigeria this week, um, a Fulani Muslim stopped a bus and kidnapped eight Christians who were involved in a ministry outreach. Now, I want to remind you that Sharia, Islamic law, allows for the kidnapping of non-Muslims. It allows for, for for slavery to take place if you were at war. So you can kidnap and make someone a slave, uh, even a sex slave. You can do that. On top of that, it allows for you to make income by kidnapping and demanding a ransom. Again, these are allowable forms of income via, guess who? Again, Islamic law. I want you to think about that. If this is something that's allowable under Islamic law, is this, are we going to expect them not to think this way? And again, it's not stuff I'm making up. You can go pick up your own copy of Reliance of the Traveler and find out the truth yourself. I wish I had good news today. I guess the best good news I had to share so far was, you know, Noni Darwish's salvation. Now she found Christ and she's willing to share that with others. So that's how we started this show. Let me continue with a story about the Christians being abducted in Nigeria. Christians in Kaduna State, Nigeria, suspect Muslim Fulani herdsmen were behind the kidnapping of eight Christians from a bus in the southern part of the state on Friday. The members of the redeemed Christian Church of God were traveling from the city of Kaduna to Kafanshan when their bus was intercepted um, some 63 kilometers southeast of the state capital. Um, one man says, please pray for my dad and the other missionaries who were kidnapped by Fulani herdsmen on the evening of Friday, March 26. He told them, this man told the Morning Star, I cannot pronounce his name. Eje Kenny Faraday, who said he was also traveling along the Kaduna Kachia Highway on Friday, posted a photo of the church members abandoned bus on Friday that day and stated that they had just been kidnapped. A spokesman for the RCCJG in the city of Kaduna, Pastor Oleshen Olubia, confirmed the kidnapping, saying the eight church members were on their way for a ministry outreach. Anko Makari, a resident of the area where the kidnapping took place, told Morningstar News by text message that the church members were kidnapped at gunpoint along the Kaduna Kaichi Kachia Highway between Doka and Mak- Makaila Kaili um, villages. I hope and pray that these men will be returned. Uh, credit has been claimed by known uh, terrorist type entities. So there's a lot to be concerned about here. Let's talk about, again, this is the time of, this is the Christians, many, many ways, the high point of their belief structure uh, this time of the year. Um, Last week, we celebrated, Christians celebrated Palm Sunday. It is the Sunday they celebrate before Easter, or is what many Christians call Resurrection Sunday. And um, it's supposed to be a high point. What do I mean by that? It's a day when you, it's kind of a somber thing too. Christians think about uh, Palm Sunday as being that day that 
Jesus rides in victory into the city of Jerusalem. He rides in as a king. I want you to think about that, as a king. Well, how did this guy, um, Jesus, walk ride in as a king? He rode in on an ass. That is it's very lowly, you would think. Yet the people broke off palm branches and threw them down in front of this king of the Jews. They knew that he was most likely the Messiah. They were willing to throw down everything for him, to give up things for him. Sadly, uh, that message did not take for many. In the following few days, he was executed by the Jews and the Romans. So let's talk about what happened in Mozambique on Palm Sunday. And this is not pleasant. Um, oh, sorry, this is Mozambique. We'll talk about what happened on, on Palm Sunday in, in Indonesia. So let's get into what happened in Mozambique. Uh, dozens of people were killed in a coordinated yet jihadist attack in northern Mozambique's Palma town this week. A spokesman for the country's defense and security forces says, including seven people, when a convoy of cars was ambushed in an escape attempt. Hundreds of other people, both local and foreigners, have been rescued from the town next to gas projects. Omar Saranga told journalists on Sunday a British contractor was among the dead, killed when suspected Islamic surge insurgents attacked his hotel compound, the Times reported. Hundreds of people fleeing the attack are arriving by boat in the port city of Pemba, Militants struck Palma, a logistics hub for international gas projects worth over $79 billion. The government has yet to reestablish control. The diplomat and a security source directly involved in the operations to secure Palma said. Reuters could not independently verify the accounts as many communications with Palma were cut on Wednesday. It's It's... They're talking about seeing uh, beheaded bodies in the streets. We're talking about over two dozen dead. Sad, shocking, horrifying. And this is happening around, again, these are people who, they're, they're being killed who claim to be, predominantly claim to not be Muslim. Doesn't matter if they're Christian or not. This is part of jihad, is eliminating the non Muslim, and that is what is happening around the globe. That's one of the reasons I read these stories, is to warn people of truth that is consistent around the globe. This next story comes from Indonesia. A couple. Um, this is come straight out of uh, Russia today, which is a surprisingly truthful piece that we don't find much in the United States these days, unfortunately. Russia today. A couple who married six months ago have been identified as suicide bombers in an Indonesian church attack on Palms this past Palm Sunday. Indonesian police have identified the suspects in Sunday's church Suicide bombing as a recently married couple with suspected jihadi ties. Families have been involved in some major terrorist attacks in the region. The explosion occurred outside a Roman Catholic church in the city of Makassar after two people entered the churchyard on a motorbike and were prevented from entering by security guards. The blast left 20 people injured and killed the attackers. It happened shortly after Palm Sunday Mass service was held inside the Sacred Heart of Jesus Cathedral. The perpetrators were identified as a couple living in the same city who got married six months ago. National Police Spokesman Argo Yuono revealed on Monday. Lab tests matched the male's DNA to a, that of his relatives and conferred the female's identity via, via fingerprints. The police only gave the initials of the man, Al, and his wife, YSF. But local media pinpointed the young couple's residence and spoke to the neighbors. Police said the couple are believed to have had links to Jamaat and Sharu Daula, an Indonesian jihadist group linked to Islamic State. Uh, the group had been responsible for a number of terror attacks in Indonesia and elsewhere in the region. 
yes, some of these things are truly sick, sad, and we need to be aware of things like this happening around the world. To not be praying, to not be concerned is problematic. Now, why do I say these things? Because to not be informed is dangerous. To not know what's happening in the world around you is is a world of danger. What happens if we don't know these things, if we don't become aware? Um, that That is a major concern. It's something we should all be thinking about. What happens if we don't become aware? Now, um, I have one more story, and I'm waiting for that piece to actually show up. <laughs> That's the joy of getting too much uh, going through the little circle of hell that happens <laughs> uh, when you, pl- pl- you use your computer and it goes into that spin. But uh, this next story is also a kicker. comes out of Australia. Three Muslim men were caught planning an attack of jihad to bring about the goals of Islam. This is what they confess is what they claim. It's not something we're making up. Again, this this story comes from the Daily Mail. Um, Again, listening to what the terrorists say is extremely important to understand. If we start to understand what's happening, maybe, just maybe, we might begin to fight back successfully. But that is not something our government has been willing to do here in the United States or any Western country that I can think of today outside of maybe Austria. And uh, it's it's just not happening, unfortunately. So this article is titled, Terrorist Trio Admit Planning a Mass Shooting Attack in Victoria to Advance Islam Through Violence. Three men have admitted to planning to gun down members of the public in a terrorist attack in Victoria. Artunk, Eric Logu, his brother Samed, and another man, Hanafi uh, Halis, on Friday, pled guilty to one charge each of conspiring between November 9 and November 19 of 2018 to buy a firearm in preparation for an attack. Documents released by Victoria's County Court show an attack against members of the public was planned for the advancement of Islam through violence. Again, this is a quote from the jihadis. The trio are due in court on June 15th for a pre-sentence hearing. Let's think about that. This is what they're claiming. This is the advancement of jihad. I'm not making this stuff up. It is what their own words claim. When are we going to learn? Now, I'm going to tell you there are an incredible amount of good shows out there um, with Global Patriot Radio. And I'm going to tell you I'm continuing to work on getting my next book out called The Cancer of Islamization. I'm hoping to have it out in the next few weeks. Um, I'm in the last final stages of getting things ready to go. And we will see. Um, I'm hoping uh, mid-April that everything will be done and uh, this book will be live and out there. Uh, again, my book covers the social norms of Islam and questions why we don't know that this is happening, why we can't identify that this is the problem. Um, if you pay attention to Global Patriot Radio, you'll find out there are many great shows out there. Uh, Tomorrow we have Dr. Andrew Herod, uh, one of the the best research writers that I know of. He goes out and gets the story. He he has the connections to the the great scholarly men that can get the truth out, and um, you definitely want to come and listen tomorrow to Dr. Andrew Herod. On Saturday, we have Usama Dakdak. Usama Dakdak is one of those incredible people who, when you take time to listen, his uh, his work is is really shockingly interesting beyond belief because he gets right down to the nitty-gritty, points out things that many people miss. And here's a man who puts his money where his mouth is. Uh, he promotes uh, – he, he translated the Quran in English, 
And I think that alone is reason enough to spend time listening to him. I often do. So I'm going to tell you, you definitely want to listen to him and Christy Johnson. They're on at 10 o'clock on Saturday night. That's Eastern time. And then if you come back on Sunday and Tuesday, Sunday and Tuesday, we have Erica Kafiristan. You definitely want to listen. Eric is one of those profound, uh, (laughs) incredibly intelligent men who are willing to entertain debates and to take chances, willing to get the discussion going. Very, very interesting. Uh, He and a a team work together, uh, crossing the crescent. You definitely want to listen to them. Uh, Sunday and tu- and Tuesday. Monday, we have the Real Radio Men, Al and Vito, uh, the Vito Esposito Show. Definitely come back and listen on Monday at 6, 6 o'clock Eastern Time. And then on Wednesday, we have Hank of Poly Sports. And next week, I'm hoping to be back or maybe sometime uh, a little bit later with a possibly different format. Um, I'm Just keep us in prayer. We are working on change and moving ahead and moving ahead towards uh where god wants us god bless you all thank you for listening 